Okay, so I'd like to thank the organizers uh, for inviting me to be here today. I'm happy to tell you about some recent work uh, that we've done on deep learning for metamaterials. First, I should acknowledge the people responsible for this work. I've been working a lot with uh, Jordan Mayloff, who's an assistant research professor at Duke University, uh, and his graduate student, Simiao Ren. Uh, one of my postdocs, Omar Khatib, a graduate student, Yang Deng in my group, and a former graduate student, Christian Adele. And all of the work that I'll show today was sponsored by the Department of Energy. So I thought by giving, uh, I'd start by giving an introduction and motivation into why we got into deep learning uh, and what metamaterials are for those of you uh, that don't know. I'll show you some of our work in deep neural networks for the forward model of metamaterials. And then I'll show you that really ultimately uh, what we want in this type of research is to really uh, solve an inverse problem. And so I'll first outline the challenges of that. And then I'll show you that nonetheless, despite those challenges, um, some ways that we've been uh, successful at solving this uh, deep, uh, um, this inverse uh, method, this inverse challenge rather. And then I'll conclude uh, and I'll give you my perspective on the future. So first I'd like to start with what are metamaterials? Well, metamaterials are a way of forming artificial structures where you have a designed electromagnetic response. So really they have some fine detail that I'm showing in the left of this bottom figure here. Uh, but we can think of them as giving an effective and average response to an electromagnetic wave. And so we can think of them as a homogeneous material. And so what we do is we might take a metal and wind it into a shape like this, shown on the top left. And if we have a time varying magnetic field, we can drive solenoidal currents around that metal. We also have a split gap, which gives us a capacitance. So this gives a resonant re uh, type response, as I'm showing here, as a function of frequency where the red part would denote the real part of that uh, electromagnetic response, and the blue would denote the imaginary part of that response. Now this, uh, this structure here wound in this way would give you an effective magnetic type of material. So again, if you formed it into an array, if you tessellated it across a plane or filled it in some volume, then you can think of it, this as a magnetic material, despite the fact that it's just a wound piece of metal. If we take two of those and then put them together, we can get an electric response if we have a time varying electric field now placed vertically as shown here. We get the exact same type of response, a resonant type response as a function of frequency. Now we can think of that as an effective electric material. So since we are running late, I'll just mention very briefly that these can be scaled throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. So for example, the width of these elements uh, dictates where in the electromagnetic spectrum this resonance will occur. Okay, so the resonant frequency denoted by omega naught is proportional to one over that width W. So this is called electromagnetic similitude. Also the area of the metamaterial compared to the area of its unit cell, remember this is a unit cell that we tessellate across the plane, determines the oscillator strength then of that metamaterial. And lastly, the constituent elements that you use to fashion your metamaterial width then uh, tell you the kind of width of this resonance, so the damping terms. Okay, so all of these geometrical parameters then can be used to fine tune your electromagnetic material. That's the takeaway message. And with these structures, researchers uh, have shown um, various exotic effects. Uh, over 20 years ago, we showed negative refractive index at microwave frequencies. Uh, that same uh, type of lens, it turns out, uh, has the ability to refocus evanescent waves as well. So one could form a perfect lens using a similar type of structure. And of course, everybody at Duke knows that invisibility cloaking is another type of option, um, a, a phenomena that one can achieve with metamaterials. So metamaterials are a subclass of a broader category of artificial electromagnetic materials. We think of metamaterials as both metamaterials and metasurfaces. Also, there are materials such as plasmonics, photonic crystals, artificial dielectrics, frequency selective surfaces, and so on. And all of those can be um, broadly described as artificial electromagnetic materials. But with metamaterials in particular, you have a great ability to control many of the scattering properties of light. I'm just putting a list here across the middle here. And um, these can be made dynamic. And of course, you can, you can choose to, to fill a plane in some particular way. So you can have good control over their spatial properties, temporal, temporal properties. This shows an infrared image of something we made with MEMS metamaterials. So this is giving you a D that shows up in the thermal infrared. Um, and then of course you have great control over the frequency response as well. Okay, so they're great. And the main, uh, I think, saline features of metamaterials 
I would say are that this electromagnetic response is coming from the geometry and not from the constituent materials or the chemistry, which is has an advantage. You get independent and direct control of epsilon and mu. Those are the two material parameters that enter directly into Maxwell's equations. So it gives you good insight into solving electromagnetics problems. They are multifunctional. We didn't have a chance to talk about that, but that's what gives you these dynamic responses that I showed on the last page. And lastly, this electromagnetic response is coming from the atom itself, i.e. the unit cell, and not from the array. The array effects are secondary to the main response. And therefore, you can design simply a unit cell. Again, you can fill a plane, and those um, properties are carried over to the larger, the larger construction. OK, so they're not perfect, though. What's wrong? Well, if we just plot all of the elements here, and I plot melting point and electrical conductivity, we see that nothing is in this quadrant. And typically for metamaterials, we're using the best metals, the highest conductivities that is. So typically gold, copper, and silver. And so if you had some application where you did need to go to high temperature, um, then you have no choices, right? That entire quadrant is missing there. Likewise, if we just consider the Drude model for metals, here I'm plotting the reflectance in the top and the conductivity, both as a function of frequency, uh, on a semi-light plot, we know we have the plasma frequency, which is occurring somewhere in the optical. That's where metals are no longer metals and they behave more like dielectrics. Uh, for more stringent requirements, however, the scattering frequency of most metals is below 10 terahertz. And so with metal-based metamaterials, you need a high electrical conductivity. And so in the infrared range and optical, then that starts to be um, challenging. And lastly, um, this is, uh, I'm plotting here the Wiedemann Franz law, which is the thermal conductivity and the electrical conductivity. All elements fall largely along that line. And again, we use silver, copper, and gold because of their properties. So automatically by choosing high electrical conductivity, you get high thermal conductivity. So again, so very, for various thermal applications, this may be limiting. Okay, so what we need then is an alternative way to form metamaterials, and people have been working on that a lot. We've worked, done a lot of work here as well. And um, a substitute for the metal-based approach is to use dielectric resonators. Okay, so you can think of these as me resonances or dielectric resonators or shunted waveguides, but they provide many of the same capabilities that metal-based metamaterials have, but new problems emerge. And so that's what led us uh, to deep learning. Okay, so let me give you an example. So if we consider a all dielectric metamaterial that just consists of these four cylinders, and I just do a simple um, simulation of these four cylinders, they're all identical, and I'm plotting transmission as a function of frequency in the terahertz, I get a pretty uh, boring transmission curve. There's nothing too exciting going on there. I take all four of my resonators, I scale them smaller, and I get another somewhat frequency independent transmiss transmission curve. Now I wanna do something exotic uh, like we can do with metal-based metamaterials. Let's say I just mix these two and make a bipartite type structure or a checkerboard. And I look at the transmission, suddenly I have many of these peaks, none of which are evident in the bottom two transmission curves. Okay, so it ends up that um, these all dielectric metamaterials do give you many of the same properties that metal-based metamaterials have, but the modes in them have an evanescent tail which hang, uh, hangs outside of the perimeter. And so you have strong neighbor interactions, which leads to a, not a, a lot of nonlinear response, which is challenging for design. Okay, so that's what led us to these deep neural networks to try to solve this problem. We exhausted all of the conventional approaches and that is optimization approaches. And so we were kind of naturally led to use machine learning or deep learning to solve this challenging problem. So what we did is we modeled um, these as this was uh, silicon in this case. So we modeled them with the Drude model. The parameters are shown here if you have interest. And what we decided to do is to use um, these radii and these heights for these cylinders. And again, this is a two by two lattice. So we just allowed ourselves to choose the height and the, and the radius randomly from this list. Um, so that ended up being a total of 816 million total possible permutations. Um, something that would be very challenging to solve directly um, by doing numerical simulation. So instead, what we did is to do some number of simulations where we uh, have geometry spectral pairs. So that is, we simulated about 18,000 geometries and we collected their spectrum, in this case, the transmission. And then this was the data set that we used to train a machine learning model. We input our geometry into a set of fully connected layers. Their widths are shown here if you have interest. 
Um, we additionally, at the output of there, use the transpose convolution and a convolution to smooth the uh, output uh, transmission. And this shows um, some results. So this is the model that we used. Let me look at, show you some more results. Uh, in each of these subplots, I'm plotting the transmittance as a function of frequency in the terahertz. And each one of them has two curves, the simulation, so that's ground truth, the red curve, and the prediction from this neural net, which is the blue curve. As you can just kind of look over this by eye, you see that the agreement is pretty well. Here are some statistics. We find uh, overall that we have an average MSE mean square error between the prediction and the simulation of about 1.16 times 10 to the minus three. This is transmission. It goes from zero to one. And so this is about 0.1%, which is quite good. 95% of these, which is shown by this dashed vertical curve here, have an MSE less than 3.4 times 10 to the minus three, also a, a decent number. And 99% of the data um, have an MSE less than about 0.6%. So all in all, quite good in terms of predicting uh, the response. So largely a success. And uh, me being a metamaterialist first and a machine learning person uh, second, I was quite surprised by that because although we did 18,000 simulations, I mentioned before we had um, about 800, and I forget the number, something million. So this is about 0.002% of the total space. So even, the, even though we undersampled quite heavily and did some simulations, this machine learning was still able to learn an accurate forward model. Okay. But ultimately, what we really want is we want to have some spectra, at least in my group for our research, we want to say, I need a spectra like this, tell me the geometry of the metamaterial that I can use to achieve that spectrum. Okay. And so often the design of complex materials or new materials lacks theory, and it's accomplished by trial and error. So if you have some theory, of course, you can connect from geometry to spectra. Uh, again, for new materials, the theory may not exist, so you might fall back on simulation or worse experiment. But if you can train a forward model that is uh, by deep learning, it's still nonetheless trial and error. So if you have a huge design space, it may be intractable. Okay? And so this is inefficient and costly, uh, even when computational simulation is faster. For us, uh, our deep learning model was a million times faster than numerical simulation. And for some problems that we've come across, that's still not fast enough, especially for a complex material. So this design space may be too large and require more of an exhaustive, uh, to, excuse me, to permit an exhaustive search. And therefore the quality of solutions that you do come up with are unknown. And so what we wanna do is to go beyond this um, incremental design approach and find an algorithmic process, ideally an inverse method is what we're after. So inverse design can provide an assessment of the resulting solutions, right? So as I mentioned, what we want to do is specify some transmission or some spectra and have some algorithmic approach. In this case, we're using deep learning to tell us what geometry we can use to achieve that spectral response. Now, why is this challenging? Um, well, this was laid out uh, by Hadamard over 100 years ago. And the way that uh, he talked about this is to say that inverse problems are ill-posed problems. And in order to understand what an ill-posed problem is, we should first specify what a well-posed problem is. Again, Hadamard laid out these conditions. He specified that we should have uh, existence, at least one sh solution should exist. Uh, uniqueness, ideally only one solution should exist. And stability, that is your solution should depend continuously on initial conditions. So for example, we're simulating some geometry space of metamaterials and we can have a forward model uh, that connects us to some manifold in our spectral space. But if we're doing an inverse problem, we might say, okay, I want some spectra and that may be not existing within our geometry space. It might indeed be possible, but it might not be within your geometry that you trained your forward model on. Okay, so that would violate existence then. And worse, you could specify some spectrum that violates laws of physics. And so it's never possible to achieve that. And I'll just uh, mention the second one, you may also specify some um, type of spectra that you want, but you may have some geometries which are really, really close to giving you that, that, that spectra that you desire, but they may lie in different regions and have different geometries. And often what your model might do is just to give you the average of those three geometries, which often is not a good solution. Okay, so those are some of the challenges. Let me show you how we overcame this with using a, uh, a deep um, learning model. So what we do is we train a Ford model um, where we put in geometry and spectral pairs. We initially have our neurons, which are have their weights free to be changed, so they're unlocked, so to speak. 
And then after we train those, we can lock those weights. So now we have an accurate forward model that is connecting our geometry to our spectra and those weights are locked. Now, if we look at this uh, similar problem here, what that allows us to do is we have a function which maps geometry to spectra. And so what we can do is to do back propagation ac across that, those neurons, and to treat now the geometry as the variable. So if we define a loss function, then we can move along that gradient surface um, and find the geometry, which will then give us that spectrum. So a well-posed problem that we solved is to then say, well, let's ask our uh, neural adjoint method, as we're calling it, to find this red curve here. And it's well-posed because we know that this spectra exists within our data set. And so indeed, when we put it into this, uh, using this algorithm here, we result and we get this blue curve. As you can see, the MSC is quite good. It's about 3.7 times 10 to the minus four. Again, this is going from zero to one, so this is a, a decent match. But now what we wanted to do is to think about energy harvesting. We wanted to say, okay, we've just trained on some cylinders with various radii and heights. Now let's do something completely different, which is to look at the external quantum efficiency of gallium antimoni, which is the gray curve here. We have no idea if we can find a good result to this because this is just the external quantum efficiency from a semiconductor. Nonetheless, uh, when we put that into our model, we can find this blue curve and find a decent match. We find about four times 10 to the minus three. And so this is an ill-posed problem and this neural adjoint method, um, which is based on deep learning, indeed is able to give us a good solution to that problem. So that's everything I wanted to say today. Just allow me to conclude. And hopefully I can put a, a, bit, a bit of time back into our symposium here. So conventional forward is uh, conventional forward design is fundamentally limited because it is trial and error. So even if you have deep learning, it's slow. Designs explored to date are simple and only represent a small sub subset of what is theoretically possible. And so a deep learning inverse approach can yield more complex electromagnetic responses than what has been shown before. I yield my time. Thank you.